morning, Cross Current. I uh, hope you're doing well this morning. Uh, this is our congregation. This is it. And uh, uh, Bodie, the worship's over. So she, she has to go back to flip puppy class. So let's get going. Bodie, you've got to go to flip. Bodie, there you go. Well, I hope, I hope you're doing well. And um, again, um, thank you for tuning in to us this morning. Uh, before we get started, I do want to do a special thanks to Jeff, Kevin, and Doug, our technical guys that are putting all this together. This is probably videotape 900 and whatever, whatever, um, and counting. It seems to be an endless trial and error, and we appreciate your efforts. Also, a special thanks to uh, Danae, Fraser, and Doug for the worship. Um, you know, it takes a lot of effort at the home, and we appreciate it. Um, so before we get started, I, I thought it'd be important to go over some elder issues uh, for the church. Um, the elders continue to meet. Um, on a weekly basis through video conferencing. Uh, sometimes it's two or three times a week. We are, we're always in contact. Um, in addition, the staff and the board of administration continue to function. And let me just say that um, I mean, we have a lot of really good people, a lot of quality people that are working on the staff and the board. And um, this it really is appreciated. Um, they care. They really care about the church. They care about keeping connected and they care about how do we reach out and how do we move forward the staff meets every tuesday morning um and the board met last tuesday night uh it's actually the board of administration and the elders met together and the focus of the meeting was primarily the budget and looking at the budget and how do we rearrange the budget um <clears throat> we are we are aware of the fact that we want to be ahead of the game here, knowing that people are going to have financial needs in the near future. And how can we help? How can we meet those needs? There are already some families that we are aware of that we have on the list, um, but we know that we haven't captured everybody. So please um, contact us, either on the website, on email. Let us know your needs. We need to have the input in order to understand how we distribute the money and how we can help people. Um, a little bit of an awkward conversation needs to happen here, and um, we don't talk about it very often across current, but the reality is that this is our third Sunday without meeting, and um, because of that, um, the tithes and offerings have gone down, which is expected. Um, so if you're in a position now where you can still give, please don't stop. Um, uh, if you're comfortable with online giving, um, please do that or mail a check-in. Um, we need to understand not only the people that have needs, but how much money we can work with so we can distribute accordingly in the weeks and months to come maybe. So anyway, uh, I wanted to do church business right up front. So let's, <clears throat> let's go ahead to the Lord in prayer and get started. Um, Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for, um, you're still there in difficult times and things we don't understand and and we're being stretched uh father you're still there and father um let us be aware of it let us um push in to you today and father as you read your word you go through scripture uh, lord let it just bring life to us um this morning in jesus name amen amen so <clears throat> it's going to be real simple this morning it's nothing earth shattering. So we're going to look at the very first book, the book of Genesis, the fall of man. And um, so we're going to be in Genesis chapter two, easy enough to find, right? Um, and so we're going to look at the fall of man. We're going to look at um, what's common. You know, we all have struggles, you know, we all have things that we're tempted by and we struggle with. Sometimes we make mistakes, right? And But there's also this redemption and restoration story that's here and it's pretty exciting, you know, and uh, so we're going to dig into that. But I'm also going to look at it from a, a very a new angle for me anyway. And um, I'm not looking at it like it's the fall of man, which is there, but also the fall of marriage. You know, the very first thing that God did after he created man and woman he put man and woman together and he called it 
marriage. And he sets some boundaries there. And he puts some rules in place and some thoughts that are in the very, even before the fall, God put something into marriage, this institution we call marriage, that we're going to look at this morning. But here's what, here's what's really exciting, well, interesting to me. <clears throat> I went to the book of Revelation. And I realized for the first time, this thing we call marriage literally bookends the Bible. Because in the last part of Revelation, in the very, very end, there's this, um, there's this uh, wedding feast, this wedding, this party, this feast, and it's a marriage of the, the Lamb of God, the, the bridegroom with the bride and the bride is described as a spotless church and it's and it marks the end and and more importantly it's it's the final victory where the enemy is defeated where the things that torment us fear anxieties addictions anger all these things are done away with Things that attack the marriage are done away with. And I had this interesting thought that <clears throat> um, maybe one of the reasons that the enemy attacks the marriage is because the enemy realized that with every wedding, with every marriage, it is one more wedding closer to the wedding. It's one more wedding closer to the end. It's one more wedding as a reminder to him that that day is going to come when he will no longer be able to torment the heart and soul and mind of people. And uh, he's not happy about that and it annoys him. And thus, um, he goes after it, right? So anyway, we need to get started. Um, Genesis chapter 2. And you got your weight on me, sure. So, and as I read this, I'm going to I'm going to add a few things in here, bring a little more color to the picture. Um, so beginning in verse 24, chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and cling or be joined to or cleave to his wife, and they become one flesh. Now both of them were naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. <clears throat> so here we have a, a, a male and female that just been created, and God puts them together. And there's three things I'm going to look at here. Um, number one is the fact this concept where he says a man shall leave his mother and father. Then number two, I want to look at the fact that what it meant to be joined together as one flesh. And then the last thing I want to look at is this idea of that they were naked and unashamed. And those are three areas I want to look at real quick. Number one, a man shall leave his mother and father. Um, now, to be fair to the scripture, it is very specific here. A man shall leave his mother and father. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to, I think it's fair to say, to apply this principle that I'm going to talk about to both the male and female, to the man and to the woman. And that concept is that there's this leaving of the past. Um, specific to the mother and father, uh, a one theologian wrote that it's basically, it's a shift of, your, of a man's priority of his affections, his affections towards his mom and his, his mother and his father. Now that priority, his affections are to his wife, to his bride. Um, and I think that was well put. But I think what else is going on here is um, <clears throat> leaving the past where it belongs in the past. I think there's a reality here that uh, many of us uh, have an abusive past. A lot of us have pain in the past. A lot of us have dysfunctionalities in our past. Uh, for whatever reason, they're there. And I think the, the beauty of marriage is this concept that we now, we, we're leaving that. And we have to be aware not to bring that in, to be on guard that, that there are things that want to come in that can hurt and harm. And then we need to leave those things where they belong in the past. And, and that may require counseling. And as we get into this further and further, this is going to come out in other areas as well. Um, but there's another side to this coin that, likewise, the mother and the father need to let go, right? Um, and, you know, Danae and I are on both sides of this equation now. Um, 
So we've had this experience of being newlyweds as well as letting go. And, uh, you know, we were both very fortunate when we got married. We had parents that really were very helpful in our marriage. Um, we had in-laws that were very helpful in our marriage, not just in our marriage, but in raising our children. Our, our children have great memories growing up with, with family members, with uncles and aunts and, and grandparents. Uh, very special, very impactful. Um, but, you know, but to be honest, there were times when Denise and I had to put up boundaries. Um, there were times when we had to say, you know, like uh, we have some ethical, moral foundations in our marriage that we're trying to preserve and, and we ask that you respect that. Uh, so we had to have those conversations and that's fair. Um, and then, and then we get to the other, other end where our daughters got married and they, they married three really great guys, you know, we're very fortunate, but yeah, Dinesh, I've been like, okay, we have to understand how to put, pull our hands off of this and, and to understand that they, they have their, their own families now. And, um, so it's good, you know, it's a learning experience, but the important thing is that we recognize this. Um, so anyway, we need to move on. So number two. Um, <clears throat> that he would cleave, that a man would cleave and be joined to, and they become one flesh. Kind of an interesting term, and uh, there's several ways to look at it. How does two become one? Maybe uh, for Christianity, we we say Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but it's one. It's one. So there's a three in one concept. Um, you know, um, body, soul, and spirit. But yet we think of it as one body. It's the same thing. And it's a, there's an attachment there of binding, a, of unity. Now, the, I, I guess the first thing you think of is physical, right? I mean, the, the thing that attracted you to your wife was she was beautiful. The thing that attracted you to your husband, he was good looking and handsome. And so there's this physical part of the marriage that's, that's, that is very um, appropriate. But there's two other things, that, and this is gonna, we're going to go in this in all the areas. Not only is there a physical intimacy, that is healthy, but it's also an emotional intimacy in that um, just the emotions, your feelings of who you are and things that, that this requires maybe some discussions and some times of how do you feel and how, what's going on in your heart? What's, what's going on in your soul? What affects you? And, um, what is it that, that, that makes you tick? It, and it is a beautiful thing there, the soul of a person, the real, the real person they are. It goes much deeper than just who they are physically, but it gets into their, their emotions and their feelings. Um, and, these, and there's an intimacy there, right? Um, and then this third thing is spiritual intimacy. This is, I think this is interesting. And to me, this is, um, <clears throat> this is where a husband and wife invite the presence of the Lord into their marriage, where they invite the, the Holy Spirit, where they, where they go from matrimony to holy matrimony, where they introduce holy into the marriage, where they allow the Holy Spirit to be the third person in their marriage, the third person who can be a guide who can say, okay, the next step in your marriage of understanding one another, here's what it looks like. That third person who's a counselor, that when there's things that are on the table, that, that Holy Spirit looks deeper. It looks like, okay, what's, the, what's that root of that issue that's coming into your marriage? What's the root of that? That's what we want to get to. Um, you know, there are things that are manifested that we lash out or speak out or whatever, but there are things that are deep that the Holy Spirit wants to reveal and to heal and to restore. And, and that's kind of exciting. And, you know, saying those three things, the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual, um, there's also, unfortunately, a, a physical abuse that many are aware of, where people have been physically hurt. <clears throat> there's also um, an emotional abuse, an ability to emotionally abuse somebody in many ways, an emotional abuse may be more painful than a physical one because it's deep. It goes deep to your soul. It goes to your feelings, and, and, and that's a hard thing to, to wrestle with. And then there's a spiritual abuse where somebody will 
spiritually overlord somebody and take authority over them and um, and control them in a very uh, unhealthy way. Um, <clears throat> so that's all there in that cleaving uh, to the wife and to the husband and, and making that thing one. Then the last thing here is this idea and this concept of that they were naked and not ashamed. This is so important. Naked but not ashamed. They were completely exposed and vulnerable to one another. They recognized everything but without shame. So important. Then within the intimacy of marriage, that not only can you expose yourself to your spouse, but you have to know that your spouse is going to protect that. That those things that, in, in, you know, in many ways, there are some things in the heart of man that really belong to God only. And these are the things that maybe that we open up to. And it's the responsibility of the spouse to recognize, oops, this is, this is confidential stuff. This stays within the marriage because I want to protect my wife. I want to protect my husband and work through these exposures and these vulnerabilities. Um, so, um, yeah, all that to say that this is the model marriage. This is what we're looking for and trying to get to. Um, it'd be nice to say we're there, but I mean, the reality is that we have to move on to the to chapter three because there's this thing called the fall that identifies and works with um, things that we struggle with. All right, let's move on. Let's go into chapter three and, and recognize that uh, the next thing we're going to look at is the actual fall of man. And let's uh, start reading in, in verse one. But the serpent was more subtle than any animal of the field that the Lord God had made. And the serpent said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from all the trees of the garden? The woman responded to the serpent, of the fruit of the trees we may eat. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you must not eat of it and you must not touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you most assuredly won't die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So here's the, here's the, the beginning, I guess the beginning of the end is right here. And some points I want to make. Um, first of all, there was this voice um, outside the marriage. And this voice comes in and the very first thing it says is, hath God said. And as I read this, I see a challenge to the authority of scripture. And the reason I say that is, as this conversation continues and gets twisted and convoluted in, in different angles, the serpent eventually goes to the point where uh, God didn't mean that. You will not die. You will not die. And now it got to a point where it's saying the word of God is not true. The authority of scripture is not true. And I think that if, if our goal is to make the authority of scripture the foundation of our life, the foundation of our marriage, the foundation of our home, we need to recognize when there's this outside entity or outside circumstance, something outside the home that is challenging the authority of scripture. Now, there's nothing wrong with questioning scripture. There's nothing wrong with saying, I don't understand it. There's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know how this applies to my life. I don't know how, I don't know what this means. There's nothing, it's different when you say, I don't think God means that. I don't think God says that. Now we're talking about marriage. We just got done talking about the physical intimacy and, and emotional intimacy and trying to say, look, some of this applies in general, but let's be specific to the marriage. That one of the biggest challenges in our culture today is this concept of physical intimacy before marriage or sexual immorality. And, 
a lot of times it, it, the, the philosophy is, well, if I'm really in love, if I really love somebody, then this, you know, come on, this, I mean, God would surely know that this is really love. And before you know it, we're in this situation where it's like, oh, you know, now what? Um, so there's this challenge that's going out um, and it's contradicting the foundation of Scripture. And there's something else that's, that's happened here. Um, and I'm, I'm going to reread it because I, I, I want to emphasize it. The argument, the, the conversation gets to the point where it says, For God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open. That, that sounds pretty good. I mean, that sounds good. You'll be like God. That's kind of an interesting um, against Scripture. And knowing good. And golly, that's, that's, it, it all sounds pretty good. Then the last thing is kind of, it's almost like it's, it's, it's not hidden, but it is hidden. The very last word the serpent says to Eve is this word, evil. And I don't doubt that, I, I, I don't doubt that Eve heard it. But I'm not sure she heard it. You know, sometimes we hear it, but we don't hear it. We, we hear the... We hear the 95% of the statement. We hear the 95%, but it's, sometimes there's something twisted in there that we didn't pick up on. And how many times do we wake up the next morning and God just, I can't believe I made that mistake. I can't believe I did that. I, I was going along great. I had all these great intentions and then boom, I, uh, I was having fun and, and et cetera, et cetera, and boom. And uh, I'm stuck. And here was is what's interesting. All, all they knew was good. That's all they knew. And at the very end, they're being offered evil. And why would anybody, why would anybody, if you, all you have is good, why would you exchange that for evil? And whatever evil would mean to you, whether that be um, somebody lying to you or uh, somebody who was mistreating you or manipulating you or whether that be physically a sickness, a disease, a cancer, a leukemia, um, or whether that be a, a natural disaster or something that ruins your life or, you know, why would you want, why would you want to even, uh, if, if you don't have to have evil, why would you buy in on it? Um, and it's just kind of, it's interesting, uh, this thing comes into the marriage and all of a sudden it's there, um, you know? And so I think this is somewhat explained in the next few verses where we go from this, this, this challenge to the authority of scripture and it kind of all of a sudden weaves in and out and, and tips over into another area of, of coming at us where in areas that we struggle with. And you know what? We all have struggles. It's just who we are. We all have different struggles that we deal with. We all have these different temptations. They're not the same for everybody. We're all different. But what happens next in the next few verses, um, it tends to look at three categories that I think are somewhat common. There may be more, but here are three categories that are identified in this story. Let's, let's, let's read through it. Now, the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a thing of uh, pleasing to the eyes or lust for the eyes, and the tree was desirable for making one wise. So there are three categories that are kind of outlined at a high level, and that is that um, it, it, whatever it was she was engaging with, it was gonna feel good, you know? Um, if you look at anybody who is tormented with addiction, whether that be alcohol or drugs or sex or whatever, initially it always felt good. Initially it always was pleasing to the flesh. It's something I wanted to do. The, the good for food part is that there is the desire that we want to feel good. And, and sometimes, in many ways, in our desire to find out who God is, we substitute for that things that feel good. Um, 
And sometimes in the end, we realize that unless it's God that's filling that void of lust, that it ends up being more harmful and that it can hurt us. The other thing is that it was whatever that they were engaging in, whatever they were looking at, it was pleasant to the eyes. Uh, this is a pretty simple one, guys. Um, every commercial on TV, every commercial on the internet, every everything that is in front of us that's trying to sell us something, it is based on the fact it's trying to please our eyes. It's this idea that I want more and more and more, and I want and it looks good. I want the new car. I want the new sports car. I want the new iPad. I want the new clothing. I want the new... It's just saying it's this constant. It's always pleasing to the eye. Um, and, uh, you know, it's greed in its basic form. This desire to want more and more. To continue in some ways with this, this uh, you know, I think the story of creation is that God put a void in all men and all women that can only be filled by him. And what we do in life is we're trying to fill this void that was designed for God. We're trying to fill it with other things. And this is where we look at it and we say, well, I want to fill it with this. If I have more money, it's going to feel better. If I have a bigger house, it's going to feel better. If I have whatever, whatever. Um, and, and that's just the, that's the nature of man. Then the last thing is to make one wise. This is kind of interesting and it's kind of a tough one in a way. But um, a lot of theologians will say this is the pride of life. That it's a pride issue going on here. Um, another way that as I was thinking about it was um, to make one wise. There's, there's nothing wrong with being wise. It's a good thing. But sometimes um, our intellect, our brain, in many ways is the greatest one of the greatest gifts that God gave us. In some ways, it's, it's a terrible thing to say. It's our greatest curse. <laughs> because what happens in so many cases, professing themselves to become wise, we became fools. And that thing which God gave us to line up with Scripture and read Scripture to make us a better Christian, we take our mind and we, through arguments and intellect, we try to prove that God doesn't exist, that we don't need God anymore, that we're smarter than God. We've got it figured out. I don't need him. I just, I know. Or another way of looking at it is that in our mind, we tell ourselves that we believe in whatever God, or we believe in a God that justifies the way I live. The God I serve justifies all of my actions. The God I serve, it just justifies the way I feel. And even if that's contrary to scripture, that's okay, because that's the God in my mind I want to serve. And I think this is where on these, these, these three areas that are maybe the most common uh, that traps that we can fall into. And again, these are struggles. These are things that, uh, that uh, whatever that is for you that we struggle with, and it's just an issue that, hey, let's identify it and be honest with it. All right, so now we're gonna we're gonna look at the last part of this. Um, we're gonna finish it up with this last reading and, and, and make some points. So um, we we've gone over this challenge that came inside the marriage from the outside. We've looked at the uh, the struggles and temptations that are, are pretty common, and uh, now we're gonna look at um, an action was taken, and with when we cross that line, an action is taken, and there are consequences. And let's. Let's go ahead and read and see what it says. So she took of its fruit and she ate. She also gave to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves a covering. And then they heard the sound, the voice, or the sound of the voice of the Lord God going to and fro in the garden in the cool of the day. So the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord in the midst of the tree of the garden. Then the Lord called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And the man responded, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked. I hid myself. And the Lord said to the man, Who told you you were naked? 
So here we have this, this, the, the rest of this story. Um, and the point of this, the first part is that, um, you know, again, an action was taken. And once an action was taken, there are consequences. Um, you know, we, it's in Christianity, we just like to live in this world that we're full of grace and forgiveness and life is just great. And, and there's definitely a truth to that. But we have to own the fact that when we cross a line and we take action, that things will happen and that there are consequences. Um, in this case, um, the action taken was they partake of the fruit. Whatever it was that was before them, there was an, an experience to happen from this temptation. And I thought it was interesting to me that it wasn't until after they both had the experience that their eyes were open. In other words, you know, we tend to, in many ways, say, well, Eve did this, and well, Adam did this. But the Bible says that it was when both of them that it affected the marriage. And a lot of times in a marriage, we get in this situation where the, the man, the husband did something. The, the wife, the female did this. And we just pick this apart. And we lose sight of the fact that it's a marriage at stake. It's this one flesh is being ripped apart. That one, that unity is being pulled at. And, and this is what's happening here. And this, the consequence is interesting. The, the marriage is under attack. The marriage is falling apart. And the first thing, the thing that happened is, is that They were naked and they hid. And now they're, this, this exposure is happening and they're hiding from the Lord. And, um, and there's this consequence of shame because of sin. Shame because of mistakes. But there's also other consequences that we can't read into fully. But if we read the rest of the, uh, in Genesis, there was a consequence to the, to the women that lasted... For generations and still last. There's a consequence to the man, to man that lasts for generations. And the point uh, that I think that I'm trying to make here is that it doesn't just affect us. There are situations that will affect our children. That the things that we do and the actions we take, it, it has a deeper impact than, than just me or just my marriage. It can impact my children. And that's a very serious thought. It can also impact my community. It can impact my church. There are far reaching consequences to our actions. And it, that's being recognized and spelled out in scripture. But this is very important. And this is the whole, maybe the, the closing is, the story doesn't end there. The story does not end there. Because the next part and the closure is that there is this redemption and restoration. And it reads like this. And they heard the voice of the Lord in the cool of the evening in the garden. And that there's this picture that despite of where they're at, that there's this I, I know, I see this, 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 such an interesting way that it's said, the, the, in the, the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. It's very therapeutic. It's very relaxing. And it's very, it's, it's this contrast of the very thing that they are hiding from is the very thing that wants to help them. And it's so true that when we, when we fall or we make mistakes, it's this natural part of us that wants to hide, that wants to cover it. And we do our best to cover it. We do our best to hide it. But the Lord is saying, I am there to help you through this. And even the very statement that the Lord made to Adam, he said, where are you? It wasn't so much uh, a, where are you physically located? As much as I think it was, 
What is the hurt and pain in your life that manifested that caused you to do this action? Yes, I see the action. Yes, there's a consequence. Yes, there's, you know, you live in a world that, that sees this and you've got to address this. But more importantly to the Lord is what happened in your heart? What was the dysfunctionality that I want to deal with, that I want to heal, that I want to cover? Let's deal with that. Let's, that, let's deal with that part. And as you go into the rest of this further on, the Bible says that God made a covering for Adam and Eve. The cover-up that they were making wasn't good enough. God had his own cover-up for our failures. And that cover-up that God gave to Adam and Eve was the skin of an animal. He took the skins. In other words, a sacrifice was made by an innocent animal to provide the covering for Adam and Eve. And that is the story of the crucifixion of Christ. That the blood of an innocent man, the blood of the Son of God was shed on the cross through a brutal death to provide the covering once and for all for the redemption of man, that our sins would be covered by him. And not just a redemption, but even more important, a restoration, a healing, a fulfillment, so that we could live in this unique state of being forgiven of what we did. Amen? It's a great story, isn't it? And, um, you know, I, I don't know, Every, I, I'm sure that everybody's in a different place in this story. Um, for many, they're, they're having a great day and the, the marriage is going great. And maybe... Uh, the story today for you would be this idea that be aware there are many voices in the world. There is, um, there is a voice of this world that is tempting and putting things in front of us. And sometimes the voice of the world can be louder than the voice of the Holy Spirit. That we always want to be able to hear that still small voice and to recognize that, uh, it's a lot of times in that it's in it's walking in that in the garden in the cool of the evening that there's this voice that says I care about you, um, and for others there may be some deeper issues, uh, and no matter where you are at in that, to understand and know that there is a redemptive story to everything, there's a restoration if we will open up to it. Amen. So once again, um, thank you for listening in. Thank you for taking the time every Sunday morning to uh, spend it with us. And again, thank you to uh, Kevin and Jeff and Doug for putting all this video together. We appreciate it. Thank you for Fraser and Doug and Dinesh for the worship. Um, have a great day. Have a good afternoon. And we look forward to this happening again next week.